Okay. Uh, before the break, we were talking about uh, intervention assistance and the need to provide accommodations for students who are not keeping up in your general ed classroom. We all know that no matter how effective our interventions are and uh, how thorough we are and complete in, in making an effort to <coughs> include children with disabilities in our mainstream classroom, there may come a time when you have a child who will need to be referred for special education and possible placement uh, in a special ed class or, or, or to receive some special education services. This is a more thorough process that starts with a referral, a formal referral for special ed uh, diagnosis. Uh, schools and districts all have unique procedures where these uh, <clears throat> uh, referral processes are concerned. So when you start teaching, you will need to determine exactly how you make an, a special ed referral in your particular elementary school or district or middle school if that's where you happen to be teaching. But certainly after a referral is made, the student will be evaluated by a diagnostic team. This team can consist of uh, an educational diagnostician. There may be input by the general ed teacher or the special ed teacher, the speech pathologist, any number of professionals associated with the school and diagnosis may be included. In some cases, uh, uh, physicians or uh, school psychologists may participate in an educational diagnos diagnosis, but this is done for the purpose of determining whether or not the child qualifies for a disability label, and if so, what label is appropriate for this student. The law, you know, IDEA refers to the meeting that is held for this purpose as a case study, uh, a, a case conference committee meeting. At a case conference committee meeting, all the individuals concerned with the student get together and go over the educational evaluation. This has to be done within 40 days after a parent signs permission for a child to be evaluated. When you refer a child for a special education and, and initiate the steps for that student to have a diagnosis, the first thing the school has to do is get in touch with the parents and determine whether or not they will allow their child to be diagnosed. If they decide that they will and sign off on that, the school has to follow through with conducting the diagnosis and evaluation and meeting to talk about it within 40 school days after that parental signature is obtained. Why do you think that might be? Why would there be such a law to stipulate that? We got rules for everything, don't we? If the mother and daddy say no, nothing can be done. But why do you think they require the school set a deadline? You've got to do this within 40 days. So they can't discriminate against people and just keep putting it off? One of the things that used to happen when they first legislated special education is that Kids would be referred for special ed, but the school would say, oh, well, we're too busy, we don't have time, we can't afford that, we'll do it next year. And so children would be referred and, let, and uh, services are legislated for them, but the, the referral and diagnosis and placement never took place because schools were inundated with referrals. So the law includes this caveat that says once a child is, the parents have agreed, you've got to get the show on the road. You've got to do something about it. So within 40 days, the case committee is, case conference committee is conducted and the participants are invited and under certain circumstances the, not only the parent but also the student can participate. This is generally appropriate with students who are older uh, who may be uh, well apprised of their rights and have strong opinions about what kind of education is appropriate for them. Uh, 
The purpose of the case study committee or case conference committee is to determine whether or not the student is eligible for special education and related services and if so, what kind of individual education plan is appropriate for this student. There's, <clears throat> the law calls this a case conference committee. You will also hear other words used interchangeably with case conference committee meeting. You may be in a district that calls this a child study committee meeting or a case study committee meeting. Locally, we tend to refer to the child conference committee as the ARD committee. What does that mean, ARD? Well, you're close. It, uh, it, the review is done on an annual basis, but the A stands for admission. In other words, we're having a meeting to determine whether the child will be admitted or we're having a meeting to, de to review the child's case and determining whether special education will be continued for him or whether he will be dismissed from special education. When we first started, providing interventions, special education interventions, what we decided to do was say, gosh, you know, we'll bring these kids into the resource room, we'll work with them a while, we'll bring them up to speed, and then we'll send them back to the general ed classroom and they'll be just fine. But guess what happened? We referred them and we remitted them, uh, we admitted them and we reviewed them, but guess what never happened? They were never dismissed from special ed. The chance of a child getting out of special education who has ever entered in special education is very, very slim. So one of the ways around that is to meet these students' needs in general ed classrooms rather than pulling them out to start with because while it's easy to pull them out, it's very hard to reintegrate children back into general ed classrooms. So I want you to be familiar with this ARD terminology because if you work in Houston area schools, you may find that the district refers to child conference committees as ARD meetings and that's the term that they're going to use to, to mean the thing that we've been talking about here today. Now then, I mentioned earlier that all the professionals and, and even including the, the parents and the child himself can attend a case conference committee meeting, but this, tra this slide just really shows you the wide range of professionals who may be appropriate to include in a child conference committee meeting. It can be everyone from a psychologist or a diagnostician to a counselor, a language therapist, occupational therapist for children who are in life skills or more um, uh, restricted settings. The school administrator or the administrator's representative is likely to be there. Social workers, paraprofessionals might be there. You mentioned earlier at the break that you were a paraprofessional in the school. Did you ever attend an, an ARD meeting? I only did once. Uh -huh. Punch down on your button. I only did once because um, I was I, ne uh, I was working with special education kids, but for me, I never believed that they belong in the special education. So when you did attend this meeting, why they must have thought you could contribute something yes. based on your special knowledge? Yes, yes, but they they thought that I was ready to say, yeah, the kids belong to special education. When I was there, I was saying, he needs to get out of special education. Oh, he so. does not belong there. So when I said that to them, never again they asked me for any more go. meetings. <laughs> because That's they, knew that, they knew that I was not, I was willing to teach these kids like a regular student. Uh -huh. I was willing to send them to a regular classroom. So they did not like what I said. Well, that's interesting. Uh, I mean, it is, it is interesting when you look at what goes out on the real in the real world, and you send out a question. You never know the answer you're going to get back. And uh, you know, I I I have to tell you, uh, the world is politics. We talked about money during the first uh, hour, and and now politics enters in. But certainly, these kinds of things do go on in schools. People 
constitute committees to affect an outcome of one sort or another. Interestingly enough, as a paraprofessional in this day and age, you could very likely have a job as a paraprofessional in a general ed classroom because we have so many children included now. You, if you weren't preparing to be a certified teacher yourself, you could probably go back to a parent professional role and assist kids in mainstream settings, which would probably be more acceptable to you based on, on what you've told me than the job placement you had in a more segregated educational setting. But in any event, as you can see, case conference committee members are constituted from a whole group of, of professionals and paraprofessionals and parents and parent representatives who have unique knowledge about the students and are able to contribute from their own individual perspectives. One of the things we certainly strive to do is ease the concerns of the parents and make certain they're comfortable and invite them into a collaborative relationship. A lot of the things we were talking about earlier with regard to communication also apply to the tone that we want to set for case conference committee meetings. Certainly when indicated related services are prescribed for students with disabilities. This can be occupational therapy um, or a wide range of related medical services of one sort or another, but anything that is required to, to assist the child in a receiving a free and appropriate education is an acceptable topic to introduce at a case study committee meeting. In the end, if a child is deemed appropriate for special education, a diagnosis is assigned and an individualized educational program is developed for that child. The IEP will contain the modifications that are needed for a particular student and, and they will spell out in detail what the student's current level of functioning is, what his long-term annual goals are, what the short-term objectives are that will lead to the acquisition of that annual goal, uh, the need for special education and related services, and it will detail exactly what these services are going to be, along with the duration of these services and who will be delivering these services. Uh, the IEP is also required to explain the extent to which a child will be participating are not participating, as it were, in a general ed classroom. The feeling is not that we have to educate every child in a general ed classroom, but if we make a determination not to educate a student in a general ed classroom, why is that? What is our rationale for deciding that a more segregated setting is in fact a more appropriate setting for the education of this particular student? Some additional components include a statement of the modifications in state or district-wide assessment procedures that may be made. This student may be required to take the tox test or he may not be required to take the tox test. He may have uh, modifications in how he takes the test if he takes it like additional time or have smaller segments of the test administered. The, the dates the delivery of services are to begin and the duration of services, the frequency of services have to be detailed in an IEP. There has to be a statement of transition services for all students who are 14 years old and older. We'll talk a little bit about more about that in a minute. Uh, there has to be uh, uh, plan for mo monitoring the annual goals to see if we're if the child is making progress and he's getting better as a general ed teacher you will not be required to prove that the child has made progress what you will be required to do is provide evidence that you have used sound judgments and and provided well articulated and well thought out instruction in order for the child to receive his annual goals. You can't be held accountable for his achieving, but what you can be held accountable for is the quality of instruction that has been provided for him and the things that you have done to facilitate his attainment of these goals. Um, we need to say how the goals are going to be measured. Remember when we were talking earlier about doing an, a modification for a student who wasn't listening and following directions? 
How are we going to determine if he's listening and following directions? We don't just do an intervention and keep doing it forever. We have to take a look at whether or not it works or not. And so the IEP includes a statement about how we're going to evaluate whether our goals have been met. A progress report for the parent, how this information and when this information will be communicated. And what components in the IEP will the parent be asked to carry out in the home. Now I mentioned earlier we would be talking a little bit more about transition services. This is an important sort of concept for you to follow. Um, along the lines of what I was talking about a little earlier in the day and that is what if your education doesn't generalize what if they had taught this young lady to read in the in by the fifth grade but she left school and never read the directions on an aspirin bottle or a newspaper well that's basically what we found out was happening with regard to youngsters in special education a number of studies were done one actually was done that I'm familiar with was done in the sci Fair district by one of my doctoral students one of ours he wasn't I was on his committee but not one of his his chair but anyhow this guy uh, went back for like five years and interviewed the parents of all the kids that had graduated from special ed in learning disabilities in sci Fair, he, he conducted an interview of the parents of these youngsters. And he asked them questions like, did you, like, did you think sci Fair provided good special ed? Parents said, oh yeah, we thought it was wonderful. Was your education appropriate for your student? Oh yeah, it was great. <laughs> Now, what did you like about it? These things. What did you not like about it? Not very much. I like most of it. You know, the school was real good. The teachers were real good. The kid liked it. Everything was just peachy keen, right? Then he asked the hammer question. What is your student doing now? Guess what they said? Staying home watching TV. What does that tell you? No matter how wonderful the student's education is, if those skills don't generalize to normalized settings, they're not worth very much to that student, aren't they? You can teach the student from now until you're blue in the face to teach, <coughs> to fill out job applications and go for a job interview and how to answer questions about the job interview. But if they never go to a job interview, even though they know how to do it, if they never go to a job interview, it's worthless, isn't it? So back many years ago, about 15, I think, but don't quote me on that, and it won't be on your test. I won't hold, I won't hold you accountable for misinformation if I give it to you. At some juncture, let me put it that way, IDEA was Re it authorized to include a component for transition plans. So every child in, who is receiving special education and related services at the age of 14 is required to have a transition plan on file. So between the ages of 14 and 21, we are working on reintegrating or integrating this student into normalized vocational or post-secondary settings. So the student has assistance in generalizing the skills that he or she has acquired in an educational setting to normalized settings so that they are uh, using the skills that they've learned to become more independent and to become wage earners and and to live independent and productive lives that they can feel good about. So a transition plan is an essential <laughs> element of every IEP for students who are 14 years or older. This is referred to as the ITP or the Individualized Transition Plan. And it is a supplement to the standard Individualized Education Plan. Legal safeguards are also included in IEPs to assure that they're monitored and uh, that the monitoring accurately reflects what's going on. 
there is a component of due process. What if you go to an IEP meeting, you have a child with a disability, you're a parent, they send you out a message, you know, we, your child has been referred, or maybe even you initiated the referral as a parent, you said, my goodness, my child needs special ed, what do you have to offer me? The school said, well, we don't know. We'll have him tested and get back to you. So they do that and you have an IEP meeting and the teacher, this happens all the time in ch with children with learning disabilities. We've got a big week coming up next week that we'll talk about because learning disability is such an issue right now and in such a state of flux. But anyhow, you have this kid, you're the parent, you have the kid. The kid can't keep up in reading. He's like the one we talked about earlier. So he can't keep up with reading. You want him referred for special ed. They diagnose him, they say, well, there's no aptitude achievement discrepancy. He doesn't qualify. You say, but the kid can't read. He's making an F in reading. He cries every day. He comes home. He has to go to school. This is a miserable experience. What do you mean he doesn't qualify? He doesn't meet our criteria. No label for him. No services. No nothing. Well, what are you going to do? Nothing. He doesn't qualify. What do you mean no service? No, we can't provide services for him. The federal government won't reimburse us. So oh, too, too bad, so sad, you don't qualify. What are your choices as a parent? Called due process. The law embodies within it a due process clause that says, <coughs> if a parent feels that the school has not provided a free and appropriate education for their student in the least restrictive educational environment, then they have a right to due process. And this due process is provided at no cost and without the necessity of the parent hiring an attorney. Where do they get this? I'm not sure right now in Houston. I think at Advocacy Inc., but don't quote me on that either, but I think that's where they get this. The service that provides these un unresolved issues that provides due process for these unresolved issues is called mediation. The parent goes and states their case, the mediator goes and states their case, and the mediator, who is a neutral party, hands down a decision that is binding. So if the parents the, or if the mediator says, well, gosh, you know, the school's right, they've held the letter of the law, there's nothing I can do for you, the parent will then have to provide a, an attorney or some other intervention. On the other hand, if the mediator says to the school, gee, you know, this child is failing, this is a miserable situation, you have to provide services, then the school is also bound to do that. Anybody who doesn't like the outcome of an IEP meeting is entitled to due process. The school can be the person. What if the school says, your child needs to be referred to special ed, he's falling way behind, he misbehaves, he can't keep up, and we want to refer your child for special education assessment. And the parent says, not my kid, you don't. You're not sending my kid to special ed, what happens then? The schools are entitled to due process. They can go to this mediator and say, this kid is wrecking our school. The parents won't have him evaluated for a potential disability. We want due process. They have that right. Do you think it happens very often? No. Why not? Because most of the time the parents say yes. Most of the time the parents say yes. And also if the parents don't say yes, usually the school doesn't want to affect that sort of conflicted adversarial kind of relationships with the parents that put them with cross, at cross purposes. I'll give you an example of how this could occur. 
in, in a most likely scenario, you have a child maybe with Down syndrome. You want your child fully included. The school says, we can't have a child with Down syndrome in a regular first grade classroom. What are you talking about? We're going to due process. But that seldom happens. Because if the parent feels strongly that the child ought to be fully included, usually the, the school district tries to affect that model on behalf of the child and make it work. Uh, because it's so bad to have an adversarial relationship between districts and parents. So while due process is available to both parties, it very seldom happens. Now, this uh, PowerPoint has to do with the general goals of an IEP. When we write IEPs, I mean, pa teachers hate them and a lot of people complain about them, but let me tell you something. An IEP is really a road map for how you get a child from where he is to where he needs to be. What if you were leaving for California tomorrow? I am, aren't you jealous? <laughs> Actually, I'm going to go to Hobby Airport and get on an airplane so I don't have to worry about this. But say you were driving your car to California. How would you figure out how to get there? We would probably go to MapQuest in this day and age. In my generation, you'd go to the Texaco and buy a map, but I'm not sure they have Texacos. And if they do, they probably don't sell maps because people print them off the Internet. But you would probably... <coughs> consult a geographical source of some sort to help you. But if you didn't have a map or couldn't get a map and none was available, you'd probably get to California anyway, wouldn't you? Don't you have some general idea about where, where California is? You'd probably get a compass and head west, right? I mean, people were finding California long before we had interstates and road maps, right? They were getting there somehow in covered wagons. So you can probably get from here to California without a map, but you might take several wrong turns. So if you were really going to California, you'd probably get you a map and get on the Katy Freeway and, and keep on trucking, huh? It's kind of that way with the IEP. Lots of teachers complain about IEPs, and it certainly involves a lot of paperwork. Lots of them uphold the spirit of the law, the letter of the law, rather than the spirit of the law. But certainly it's a good idea if you're going somewhere to get directions, right? And to me, IEPs are directions for a student's education. They really are designed to provide a common understanding of what the child's student, the ch student or child's strengths, needs, and weaknesses are, as well as his interest and what motivates him and this sort of thing. It allows us to share information and observation about students' behavior with others. It allows us to understand academic as well as non-academic priorities for an individual student and plan what are the most appropriate outcomes for him not only the long term, where are we going in the long run, but what kinds of subcomponents or instructional objectives will help us get there. Uh, when are services going to start? Who's going to deliver them? How they are going to be delivered? These kinds of things are very important. And they are affected most uh, desirably by a collaboration between not only parents and and schools, but also between special and regular educators. And you will certainly find out, without a doubt, when you enter the schools, that you will need to work collaboratively with general ed teachers, if you're a special ed teacher, or special ed teachers, if you're a general ed teacher, to see that we're putting together the best educational package for a student with disabilities. Certainly, communication is key. And the effectiveness of this student's education will depend largely on the types of adaptations and accommodations that are designed and implemented for him or her and the enthusiasm and effectiveness with which you execute those activities. There are several models that we use in, in designing and delivering this set of services. 
and it would be very good for you to be familiar with these major models because as a general ed teacher, as well as a special ed teacher, you will be in a setting where you are interfacing with these other professionals and they may very well be in your own classroom and working with you uh, cooperatively with many of the students who are assigned to you as uh, the general ed teacher. Co-teaching is the term that we uh, use to describe a classroom in which a special ed teacher and a regular ed teacher work side by side. Um, we use a co-teaching model to help us meet the needs of diverse learners in a general ed classroom. There are many, many benefits to co-teaching. Uh, one of them is they tend to improve the instruction and enthusiasm for, of teaching for everybody. If you have a setting where you can be in a position to have a co-teacher that you like and interface well, you'll probably think it's the most fun job you've ever had. I have been in a co-teaching setting myself. In my particular case, I was working in a psychiatric hospital long before children were mainstreamed, you know, in general ed classrooms. But I was a reading uh, language arts teacher and my co-teacher was the math teacher and we taught science and social studies together in a psychiatric facility for children with behavior disorders and we had a wonderful time and have been lifelong friends and even though this occurred at the University of Iowa, it just so happens she lives in the city of Houston and so we have easy access to one another here many, many years later. But uh, you will find that uh, if you have a co-teaching situation that works for you, it's really a fabulous fabulous system. Uh, on the other hand, there are some barriers to co-teaching, things that can go wrong. Uh, there may be lack of sufficient time in planning, lack of materials. Certainly there are two personalities put close together. And, uh, and it doesn't always work as it should. In co-teaching, you may have a certified special ed teacher and a certified general ed teacher, but there are also other models. You may have heard me mention earlier the possibility for this young lady as a paraprofessional might be to work in a general ed teacher's classroom with students who are having disabilities now. For example, uh, if um, you were, have any of you all been in a class where you had a student uh, with hearing disability? And, and the student, and an interpreter came with the student. I had that interpreter, I love that interpreter, I know him. I think there's just one of them, but he took my class and I had all my materials. Um, uh, you know, uh, he keyboarded them all so a person who uh, had a hearing disability could read and see everything they needed and I kept those resources for a long, long time and I still bump into him every once in a while on campus and I keep thinking I'll, uh, get another student with a hearing disability, but this young lady I had well, had a pretty severe hearing disability. She was going to teach children uh, with deafness and hearing loss, and so I had her in here. And, but that sort of model might happen to you if you're a co-teacher. You might have a deaf student who's in your classroom who has an interpreter there to help that student get along. So that would be an example of when you might be in a classroom with a general ed teacher and an assistant. There may be, you may be with a co-teacher who is parallel to you, but you do station teaching rather than the special ed teacher teaching only the special ed kids, the general ed teacher teaching only the general ed kids. You will teach the math center and the, and the science center and she will teach the reading and language arts center or whatever. Parallel teaching, you may be teaching in the same classroom at the same time you may take tyrants teaching. This is especially effective if you have a student with behavior disorders because you may want one teacher presenting the lesson to everybody but you may need a backup person or a co-teacher to assist if a behavior disorder exhibits itself. When we were in the hospital and did co-teaching in science and social studies, we had all the kids together and there were about 15 of them at one time and all of them were diagnosed and removed from a mainstream setting and put in a lockup hospital facility. So as you can imagine, there was a great potential for misbehavior to occur. So one of us would teach a lesson 
I think I taught social studies and Dee taught science, and the other one would be behind the classroom making certain that if a behavior disorder occurred, that would be dealt with without interrupting the class because there's nothing that reinforces misbehavior like the notion they can control the whole class. If they just misbehave a little bit, they can really get you going. So those kinds of things. But there are several models discussed in your book. We were so fortunate today to have somebody with paraprofessional experience, and it's discussed thoroughly in this chapter, but you may be, uh, find yourself in a situation where your assistant is a paraprofessional. Uh, they're certainly becoming more common in today's schools, and we encounter them often. There are some things to keep in mind if you are interfacing with a paraprofessional, and uh, one of them is the background and the training of paraprofessional. You may need to help them acquire some of the skills they need to have. You need to be clear about what their roles and assignments are going to be and how they're going to relate to the student with disabilities as well as the other, and you need to communicate uh, clearly and effectively with them. There are many paraprofessionals who really make a fabulous contribution, but certainly it is an effortful relationship. Uh, um, this last transparency uh, really dwells <clears throat> more on effective con uh, collaboration with parents. When we were in the section of this lecture that focused more on effective communication, I really dwelled quite a bit on parents. So. I don't know that we need to go over that a lot, but I just want to encourage you to be sensitive to parents. I remember once many years ago, I had a student in the, in the uh, I was teaching human development and learning then, and this lady was probably about 45 or 50 years old. She had been a stay-at-home mom, reared her children. and and she came, was coming back to school to prepare to be a teacher and getting her master's at this time. And uh, she said, you, she held up her hand and she said, you know, when I was a parent, I thought that schools had all of the power. And now that I'm a teacher, I realize that parents have all the power. And of course, as I listened to her tell this story, what I realized is we are members of a bureaucracy in which everybody feels powerless. And the only way to make parents feel powerful in this situation, other than ha encourage them to sue you, is to collaborate with them so they can feel like they're heard and their needs are, are being met and you have the best interest of their their students at heart. So that's something I want you to keep in mind as you go through this sort of generic dialogue that's in your book about what it takes to make working with parents. It all seems so easy when you say, have an advisory group, do this, do that, active listen, do this. But when it gets down to the nitty gritty and you're two people you, you and a parent, you need to really make sure you don't lose sight of the fact that this child's best interest is what you have at heart. That child, even though you may think so some days, that child didn't really get up that day and come to school just to torture you. That child is as confused in sorting out what his role is and how he's gonna have his needs met in that setting as you are, in all probability, he's only 10 or, you know, somewhere between 4 and, and 12 years old if you're a te teacher's in grades 1 through 8. So I'm going to leave you on that note and take a work session and let Kim go over your guide and in independent practice. I'm going to encourage you to get your lessons submitted. <laughs>
Okay, we're on. <laughs> this is the guided practice for chapter two. This will also be included uh, when you look at your assignment two on the WebCT Vista. The guided practice will precede it, so you'll be able to see all of this again. I think it's particularly important with this assignment because we're going to be talking about some specific things uh, and some specific points that you may need to review before you do the assignment for assignment two. I won't go over all of these individual education plan points with you. Again, uh, Dr. Goodman had done that so well with you about all of the things that are included in an individual education plan. I will say that the individual education plan is really a critical component of the child's special education, the special education child's program. Um, it represents a culmination of all the assessments and the parent input and the classroom teacher's input and the consideration of the child's needs. So it really is a, a critical part of the child who isn't going to be in special education, a critical part of, of the program. You, as a, spe as a general education classroom teacher, may never be fully responsible for writing IEP objectives and IEP goals, but you will definitely be in the collaboration portion of that with the special educator and the rest of the team in writing those. So we are going to look at, for this assignment, uh, the short-term and long-term goals and objectives uh, and how to write those effectively so that when you, when you look at that IEP, when you look at those goals and objectives, you know exactly what you want that child to achieve for the year. The long-term objectives are for the year and the short-term goals support that long-term, uh, support those long-term objectives. The long-term annual goals you want to make sure are measurable. Otherwise, this is a behavior that is observable. I used to have a professor who used to teach us in a class writing long-term annual goals and short-term objectives. What does it look like? Well, I want, I want this student to do good in math. I want this child to learn the alphabet. Well, what does that look like? Does that mean that child can write the alphabet, say the alphabet, sing the alphabet, recognize the letters? What are we looking for here? Okay, so they have to be measurable. It has to be an observable behavior. Long-term annual goals should be, and short-term objectives should be stated in a positive way, um, a positive manner as opposed to a negative manner. And we're going to—I'm going to show you an example of that in a, a moment. They should be student-oriented. Otherwise, you want to describe what the student will do. They should be relevant. They should be provide for the current and future needs of that student. Shouldn't be something they already know how to do. It shouldn't be something that's so out of reach that that may be something they may be working toward a couple years from now. Let's look at this goal. The student will improve reading. Would we say that's measurable? Well, 
how, I can't, what does that look like, improved reading? Does that mean he's going to be able to uh, read fifth grade words, first grade words? Does that mean he'll be able to comprehend one paragraph? Well, that, does that mean he'll be able to comprehend a whole story? It's not really measurable. How do I measure that? A better goal would be the student will read and comprehend fourth grade materials. You see how I made it more specific? That would be an excellent long-term goal for the year. The student will stop swearing. That is not stated in a positive manner. Any suggestions how I can make that, state that in a more positive manner? To make that a, a more effective goal. How about the student will use appropriate language in the classroom? State, that's stated in a more positive manner. Should be student oriented. The student will be given materials by classmates. Well, that doesn't tell me anything about what the student will do. It tells me what the classmates are going to do. But this IEP objective is not, is not for the classmates. It's for the student. So I might correct that by saying the student will gather needed materials and put them away appropriately or properly. And of course, relevant, uh, the goal should provide for the student's current and future needs. That could include social emotional functioning, behavioral, communication, mobility, vocational, as well as academic areas. And you will have students in your classroom that not only do they have academic goals, they have behavioral goals. They have social emotional goals, mobility, communication. There's a wide range of possible goals that a student will have on their IEP. The short-term objectives support those long-term goals. Otherwise, yes, I want this child to read and comprehend on a fourth grade level. How am I going to get there? What are my short-term objectives that are going to lead that student to accomplish that long-term goal? Short-term objectives need to be the first four, same thing as the long-term goals. They need to be measurable, they need to be positive, student-oriented, and relevant. But we're going to add to that. Those short-term objectives need to specify conditions. Where? Under what circumstances? Okay, where's the student going to be? What's going on around him or her? They also need to specify the behavior. Um, like I said about the alphabet. Well, the student will know the alphabet. Well, do they need to be able to write it, read it, say it? Okay, you need to specify the exact behavior. And specify criteria for mastery. The student will be able to write his alphabet letters in order uh, nine out of 10 tri trials. Okay, not often you'll see 100% on a goal Unless, <laughs> unless you're not expecting mastery, because none of us is perfect. Even, even teachers don't do it 100%. Let's look at this goal. When attending school assemblies, the student will sit quietly and keep hands to self at all times. Is it measurable? Sure is. Yeah, I can see that. What does it look like? It looks like a child sitting on the floor with hands to himself being quiet. It's measurable. Is it positive? Yes. Yeah, absolutely. I'm not saying the student won't touch, each, won't touch other students around him during the assembly. I'm saying it in a positive way. Student-oriented? Yes. Mm -hmm. Telling what the student will do. Relevant? Yes, assuming that this child has difficulties in that area. Does it specify the conditions mm -hmm. at the school assemblies? Specify behavior? Absolutely. Specify criteria? At all times. Mm -hmm. That is a good short-term objective, maybe for uh, uh, one of your long-term goals that's behavioral. How about this one? The student will read aloud Dolch first grade sight vocabulary words when presented one at a time during one-to-one -one instruction with 90% accuracy. Measurable? Vary. You know, you have, those, you, you have the materials that you're going to use, those Dolch first grade site vocabulary words, presented one at a time during one-on-one -on -one instruction. Positive? Mm -hmm. 
Student oriented? Mm -hmm. yep. Relevant? Assuming the child has trouble reading sight words, yes. Specified conditions? Absolutely. Specified behavior? Mm -hmm. Specified criteria? 90% <coughs> accuracy. And that's a good, measurable, positive, student oriented objective. Any questions about that so far? I'm a fast talker. <laughs> questions? Okay. Let's take a look at this long-term goal. The student will do better in math. Good, good goal? Not really. Any suggestions on how I can make it better? Any suggestions on how I can make it measurable, positive, student-oriented, and relevant? Think for a minute. Maybe write it down if you have a thought. Anyone have idea? If you were, if a student came into your classroom and the uh, special education specialist said to you, well, I want the student to do better in math. Well, you're a fourth grade teacher and okay, you, you got to give me more than that. Do better in math in what areas? How much better? Where is he now? Okay. So a better way to say it might, oh, I'm sorry, <laughs> I didn't put them down. Any suggestions? Hmm? How about uh, the student will perform mathematical operations on a fourth grade level? Yeah. And then you can come up with your short-term objectives to support that long-term goal. What will I have to do on those objectives to have that student perform mathematical operations on a fourth grade level? How about the student will enjoy being with classmates? That's a good social-emotional goal. Right? Good goal? Okay, if it's a good goal, what does that look like? Enjoy being with classmates. What, he's smiling? <coughs> he's laughing? He's not in the corner? Not a very good goal because I don't know what it looks like. It's not measurable. It's not observable. Any ideas on an objective that might be better? Oh, we got shy this afternoon, Dr. Goodman. <laughs> How about, uh, yes, yes ma'am. I was going to say that the student could enjoy, uh, could work well with others in the classroom during certain group activity times. Exactly. You've, you've specified a lot of more specific things in there. The student will play games with other students during unstructured classroom time. Can I see that? Sure. Is it measurable? It's observable? It specifies when? Specifies how? That would be much better. Good thinking. The student will not break rules. Good objective? Good long-term goal? He won't break rules. What's wrong with it? First of all, it's not positively stated, right? How can I turn that around and make that positively stated, make, stated in a more positive way? Any ideas? <coughs> the student will follow That's it. <laughs> the student will follow rules as put down, as demonstrated, as, you know, put forth by the classroom teacher. And then your short-term objectives under that will say which rules he needs to follow and how and to what criteria. Let's look at those short-term objectives. Oh, it's a long list for those, isn't it? The student will learn addition. Lots missing here. It's, it's stated positively. We know he's going to learn something. Got any third grade teachers in here? Want to be third grade teachers? No, not one. Wow, we need good third grade teachers. <laughs> you going to be a third grade teacher, perhaps? I, was, I wanted my certification in fourth through eighth, but okay. I've been substituting and I've fallen, fallen in love with third graders. Okay, well, click your little microphone there and tell us maybe how we can improve this objective on a third, for third grader. The stu I'll get you started. The student will perform... The student will perform 
form third grade objectives pertaining to addition? Okay, let's look back for a minute. Our long-term objectives that the student will do better in math. And then my short-term objectives that went along with that was the student will learn addition. Perhaps we just should, could say the student will be able to perform um, two-digit addition with sums less than 20 80% of the time, 80% of trials. Is that a good one? Real specific, isn't it? I know exactly from reading that objective what I want that child to learn. I want that child to be able to perform two-digit addition with sums less than 20, 80% with 80% accuracy. As a classroom teacher, will you know what to teach that child? As a classroom teacher, will you know what to expect from that child and be able to tell the, the parents and the special educator, he has mastered that goal. She has mastered this goal, that short-term objective. Do you, see, do you see where I'm going? Getting the hang of it? This is not easy. I used to, <laughs> I've taught special education students 15 plus years, and I used to give classes to teachers who were special educators on how to write effective IEP objectives. It takes practice. You, it's all, almost like a mindset you have to get into. It has to be precise, has to be observable, has to specify criteria. The student will be invited to play games. That's under our social emotional goal that we had, that the student will be enjoy being with other students. First of all, is that student oriented? Uh-uh, that's telling what other kids will do. They'll invite him to play games. So a better objective would be, who wants to try? The student will, you, you have it, press your microphone. Uh, the student will interact with others while during like playtime or role playing mm -hmm. or break time on their own, I guess. Okay. The student will interact with other students during free classroom time. Okay. Exactly. More specific. Okay. Student oriented. And your criteria for that might be um, four, four out of the five days of the week. Otherwise, if you have non structured time every day at this time, four of those days he will enter in with games with other students and participate. You can even make it more specific and say, and when he loses, he won't lose control, he'll lose gracefully, etc. <laughs> that's, a, that's a big one, especially with elementary students. The student won't run in the hallway. Positively stated? No. This is another big one with elementary students. Anyone want to take a shot at this one? How we can make it a better objective? Hmm. Well, we don't want him to run, so what do we want him to do? Wow. Yeah, we just made it positive, didn't we? So the student will walk in the hallway when? <laughs> At all times might, would be wonderful. <laughs> What, what are your conditions? When alone in the hallway? When in line with other students? When walking with, with a teacher? All of those things would be appropriate. Those are your conditions. Criteria might be all of the time we would like to shoot for, okay? 80% of the time when observed, etc. That goes along with some of our behavioral objectives, okay? Be careful with your objectives. I had a child with autism once, and one of our behavioral objectives for him was to, when he would walk down the hallway with you, he'd run away, which was not good, because even when I did wear heels, I didn't want to chase him. When I didn't have my sneakers on, I didn't want to chase him. And he was fast, and he could hide. <laughs> and I hated going to the office and, and saying, I lost a kid. <laughs> you need to put on an all points bulletin. Not a good thing, right? So one of our objectives for him was when you are walking with this child down the hall, he will walk with you and not run away. Well, <laughs> he took it quite literally and would cling to you as you walked down the hall. 
So you're walking like this with this child attached to your side. So what did I have to do? Well, I had to do another objective saying, we'll walk oh, a foot apart down the hallway without running away. So you have to be careful with your objectives, okay? Because when I say, hold on to me, don't run away, I had a leech on my side, okay, walking down the hallway. One thing you have to remember about objectives, they take practice in writing. Remember, think about the, the behavior that you want, whether it's academic, okay, uh, being able to read a paragraph and finding the main idea, things like that, uh, math, science, social studies, whatever it is. Think specifically about exactly what you want and that will help you write your objective. If you get an IEP or looking at an IEP that someone has written and you look at the objective and you think, well, I, don't, I don't know how to teach a kid to do, what, what, what do they want? What are we looking for? Okay? You need to ask someone, maybe the special educator or the special education specialist in your school, exactly what are we looking for here? Because when you have that road map, exactly what you are to expect from a student who is receiving special education services, your job comes a lot easier. And when you sit down with a parent in that meeting for the annual review, you can say, he has mastered this, and she has mastered this, and we have worked on that, and she's almost here. Okay? Not only does it make your job easier because your objectives are clear, it makes your report to the parents much more specific so they can see exactly where that student has been, is going, and what they have mastered. Remember too that IEP objectives are not set in stone. If you get, a lot of time uh, teachers in the general education classroom will get uh, to look at the IEP, I hope so, you're looking at the IEP, or at least the list of objectives that has been typed up so you can see exactly what that student is uh, supposed to work on. And you'll see some in there that may not be realistic. Talk to the special education teacher about this. And you know what? I'm not sure this is a realistic goal for my classroom. Let's talk about this and maybe revise it a little bit. You may get halfway through the year, and that student has mastered all the goals. Oh, wouldn't that be wonderful? And you need to go back to the ARD meeting to say, we've mastered these goals, and we need to revise and come up with some new goals. You may think that some of the goals are inappropriate or need revised. Otherwise, this goal is not quite third grade, what we're doing in here. Let's revise this goal so that student will be able to, uh, to accomplish it better. Okay. On your assignment, uh, for assignment number two, it is writing IEP long-term goals and short objectives to support those. I, I hope everyone will attempt to, uh, to write these. As I'm saying, they take a lot of practice and some thought. But once you are good at writing IEP objectives and goals, it spills over to your regular classroom students, too. And guess what? When you're writing a lesson plan, at the top of that lesson plan, all of a sudden you're writing goals. This is what I want my students to learn under these conditions to meet this criteria, stated in a positive way, it's relevant to what we're doing, it's measurable and observable, and then you'll know if all of your students in your classroom are meeting the goals you have for all of the students. Okay. Are there any questions? As I said, this guided practice will be posted uh, along, if you, when you click on assignment two, it will give you the guided practice and the assignment. So you can go over all of these slides again and see exactly what we talked about and what we worked on. Okay, good luck with that. Y'all are getting lazy on board camp. <laughs>